Bushwhacked is the third episode of Firefly, but was the second to air, thanks to Fox. The episode was written and directed by Tim Minear, and its story uses a curious structure that further develops some of Firefly's deeper themes. The term bushwhack means to live or travel in wild or uncultivated country, and in this episode we see what happens when that wild or uncultivated country hits back. <laughs> is taking a little time for recreation in the bay with a game of, I'm gonna say, hoop ball? The structure of the opening scene is important, as it reinforces the current state of each character, as well as develops one of the episode's key themes, civilization versus the frontier. Inara and Simon, the two most cultured of the group, watch the game looking down from above. Their clothing still showcases an influence of high society, though Simon's is evolving compared to the pilot. His sleeves are now rolled, and he has no tie. He is confused by the game, but Inara's reaction to it reflects understanding. Who's winning? I can't really tell. They don't seem to be playing by any civilized rules that I know. Well, we're pretty far from civilization. Inara understands the situation better, but she is where she chooses to be. And while Inara and Book don't consider themselves part of the crew, Book has still chosen to play the game. When the proximity alarm goes off and Wash has to go to work, Kaylee invites Simon down from his position, metaphorically, into their world. Play for our side. Inara won't mind. And then, of course, there is River, still on her own from everyone. Jane and Kaylee's brother-sister bond continues. Yeah, little Kaylee's always one man short. In the cockpit, everyone takes in a view of the derelict, and the blocking gives us a hint of the current state of all the characters and their relation to Mal. The trusted in the front, Anara slightly in the back, the doctor just barely inside and far off on her own, River. Again, revealed through a camera motion rather than a cut. The crew argues as to whether or not to check out the derelict, with Book, as usual, being the conscience. Shall I remind you of the story of the Good Samaritan? I'd rather you didn't. As the team dresses to search, Simon, the most civilized of the group, expresses his terror at the nothingness of space, and Jane acts with his typical compassion. It's impressive what nothing can do to a man. Like that fella we bumped into. He likely stuck up under our belly about now. That's what space trash does, you know, kind of latches on the first big something, stops long enough. It'd be a bit like you and your sister, wouldn't it? The ship shows signs of being taken rapidly. There are trays of uneaten meals and supplies left behind. A terrifying personal log appears to somehow wake River on the ship. Jane pranks Simon over to the derelict, and River follows, pointing out the defiled remains of the reverfied colonists. They discover a traumatized survivor. Kaylee, ever the cheerful one, isn't sure the dude killed anyone. Jane is assured of it. When the survivor looks out the window at Kaylee and Anara and says, oh, cattle. <laughs> Cattle for the slaughter. Mal's mind is made up. Dope him. As Kaylee frees them from a reaver trap, Book tends to the dead, and just as they're about to set sail, the Alliance comes upon them, and the second act and flavor of the episode begins. Mal asks Simon to bring River to the bay, and Simon doesn't take it well. Is that why you let us stay? So you could use us as bargaining chips? Don't be a fool, son. Book already knows and understands what Mal intends to do, by virtue of the conversation he had with Mal in the previous episode. The Alliance boards and searches the ship. In his exchange with the Alliance officer, Mal uses his full heroic title. I'm Captain Malcolm Reynolds. As well as very particular language to answer his questions. A brother and sister. When I search this vessel, I won't find them, will I? No children on this boat. I didn't say children. Siblings. Adult siblings i misunderstood no chance they could have stowed away no one would blame you for that captain i know how these older model fireflies tend to have those troublesome little nooks do they as ever with mal verbalosity is mostly just an opportunity for cunning the alliance discovers the survivor has scarred himself and one of my favorite scenes in the series commences the interrogation this is pure character play. A scene more typical of a show in its second or third season rather than its second or third episode. Is there any particular reason you don't wish to discuss your marriage? We're very private people. The legs. Oh yeah, I definitely have to say it was her legs. You can put that down. Her legs and right where her legs meet her back. 
And as the interrogation proceeds, the search continues on Serenity. This particular guy always kind of pisses me off. Did you think the Tams were hiding under that placemat, you numpty? Anyway, it's revealed the Tams are clinging to the body of Serenity for life, Simon in sheer terror, and River with awe and joy. The survivor escapes back to the ship, Mal bargains his way into leading the search party, and upon Mal saving the Alliance officer from the Reaverfied survivor, the Alliance departs and sets Serenity free, though they take the cargo. You had to. Couldn't let us prop it. Wouldn't be civilized. Bushwhacked essentially breaks into two discrete acts. After a quick prologue, the first act takes place mostly on the derelict ship, giving us the clearest glimpse yet of the Reavers. And the second act, drastically different in tone, begins when the Alliance appear. Juxtaposing them against each other as he has, Tim Benear sets up the Alliance and Reavers as mirror opposites of a philosophical spectrum. More on that in a minute. Given the monsters it seeks to shape, the first Reaverific act of the episode is one of the more curiously horrifying and actually scary of any in the Whedonverse, and its aesthetics are heavily influenced by the horror genre. The derelict is bathed in darkness, Kaylee says the ship is in perfect mechanical condition, and yet no one bothers to hit a light switch before a good scare can be served up, wide-angle lenses used throughout the first act distort reality at their edges and are a common tool in horror for making us feel uncomfortable, Bushwhacked also contains a fun few nods to some very prominent horror influences. In the film Event Horizon, a rescue team is sent to find a ship with a futuristic propulsion drive that, they discover through research and personal logs, sent the ship to literal hell, whether it was a special one I couldn't say, and brought it back haunted. The evil it was exposed to infects and turns the members of the rescue team against each other. In the case of Bushwhacked, that hell is an attack from the Reavers, which infects the only surviving crewman who haunts the ship. Mal indirectly calls out another famous horror influence during his interrogation scene. He looked right into the face of it, was made to stare. In Stephen King's It, a supernatural pure evil, which often takes the form of Pennywise the Clown, marinates his prey in their fears before consuming them. There is a recurring line in the story. You'll float too, you'll float too. Time to float. Which is a reference to the way Pennywise's balloons float, the way corpses float in the sewers he drags them down to, and the way his victims float in the air and are driven insane when they see his true essence. The first act of Bushwhacked features a body floating in space, Pennywise's red floating balloon, victims floating in the air, and a man driven insane when exposed to evil's true essence. Other than the self-evidently wonderful interrogation scene, there are some nice character bits throughout. Jane pranking Simon, the object of Kaylee's attention, is a nice extension of his brotherly relationship with her, and rather than simply crumbling under it, Simon reasserts himself as the first to tease Jane about being attacked by the survivor. Oh yes. He's a real beast. It's a wonder you're still alive. Look bigger when I couldn't see him. I love the visual of Kaylee cutting a pressure line and Serenity, the tenth character on the show, bleeding. Zoe, again, life in Greek, and metaphorically Mal's connection to it is the one regularly concerned with the lives of the colonists. Even on a lifeboat. You'd think those who escaped would find room for some of this. I love her knowing look when Mal agrees to Book's funeral requests. In this scene, when he's speaking to a room full of voyagers that all represent parts of himself, he's variously putting them at ease while having multiple motivations. There is more than one truth to this scene and to this moment. Mal is complex, and this room of people with different interests works as a wonderful representation of his own inner push and pull. The shape of River's trauma is coming into clarity. Several of her moments of anxiety in this one are either shockingly coincidental or an indication that something more complicated is going on here. But her most significant moment comes when, clinging to the side of serenity with Simon, she peers into the nothingness of deep space, and we see her happy, joyful for the first time. She is not afraid of the emptiness, but welcomes it, and is the only one who traverses the bridge between the two ships without a spacesuit. In terms of Mal's heroic journey, the loose classical parallel here would be Odysseus landing on Circe's island. When he gets there, it's just supposed to be so his men can get provisions, but Circe drugs him and turns them all into pigs. Odysseus falls for Circe and lets a year of his voyage for home waste away. When he is finally convinced to leave, he must descend into hell, where he witnesses the woes of many mythological lives, including Sisyphus. In the video for The Train Job, I briefly referenced some of the show's existential underpinnings in reference to Mal's line about choice. 
But after watching Bushwhacked, I think a more thorough unpacking is necessary. Now stick with me here. This may seem like a bit of a tangent, but all of this becomes more and more relevant as the series goes on. Broadly speaking, philosophy is the study of reality and existence, often to address certain fundamental questions we all ask. For instance, does my life have meaning? That question by itself could be read as the theme of every show in the Whedonverse, from Buffy to Firefly to Dr. Horrible. And in the commentary track for Objects in Space, Joss Whedon said that he is an atheist and an absurdist, commonly considered an offshoot of existentialism. The fundamental underpinning of existentialism is that the universe and everything in it is meaningless. There is no purpose, no cosmic justice, no rules. And yet, absurdly, the human animal is one born with an insane craving for meaning and purpose. The man most associated with godless existentialism is Jean-Paul Sartre, whose book Nausea Joss Whedon described as the most important he'd ever read. The term nausea was what Sartre used to describe his protagonist coming to the realization that nothing in this universe is intrinsically meaningful. A chair doesn't have some essence that makes it a chair, neither does a lamp or a ship or a gun. They're just objects. They don't mean what we think they do. Sartre found this terrifying as, if nothing is intrinsically meaningful, then we are all tasked as individuals to invent our own moral code to live and make choices by. And he called failing to do so acting in bad faith. While the universe does exhibit some gravitational push and pull over our circumstances, we as individuals can never have taken from us our freedom to choose, even if the choice is just how we choose to suffer. If we fail to do so voluntarily, if we fail to make moral choices and pretend as though we are not free, then we deny our authentic selves, abandon our only ability to make life meaningful, and become nothing more than objects in space. Existentialism raises a number of questions, not the least of which is, if morality Morality is totally arbitrary, then what's to stop someone from choosing to be a Nazi, if they believe that to be an expression of their authenticity? Sartre believed in man's absolute freedom, and he himself had some questionable positions about Stalinist communism and the gulags. But in contrast to the terrifying nausea of Sartre's protagonist, Whedon described his own first moment of existential clarity as exhilarating. Albert Camus is the man principally responsible for absurdism, and in his essay The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus used the Greek myth as a metaphor for the existential condition. Sisyphus was condemned by the gods to push a rock up a hill, and just before the rock got to the top, it would roll back down to the bottom and Sisyphus would have to go and get it. For all eternity. Why, Camus wondered, did Sisyphus just not take a seat at the top? Why go and get the rock? Why continue to participate in such an intrinsically meaningless pursuit? And that's us. To Camus. One job, one relationship, one day after another after another. Of Sisyphus, Camus wrote, if the descent is thus sometimes performed in sorrow, it can also take place in joy. This word is not too much. It happens that melancholy rises in man's heart. This is the rock's victory. This is the rock itself. But crushing truths perish from being acknowledged. I take this to mean that, while for some there may involve grief in the acknowledgement of an intrinsically meaningless universe, it's still meaningless. If life is empty and meaningless, then it's also meaningless that it's empty and meaningless, and the terror and nausea of Sartre's protagonist is still a meaning that he was creating, one not intrinsic to the discovery. Camus continued, all Sisyphus's silent joy is contained therein. His fate belongs to him. His rock is a thing. There is no sun without shadow, and it is essential to know the night. For the rest, he knows himself to be the master of his days. The rock is still rolling. Both Sartre and Camus were vague on their explanations of morality. Though Camus' writing seems to indicate a belief in certain values common to all human beings as human beings. But where Sartre thought perfect freedom and perfect justice could be accomplished through communism, Camus believed there was a delicate balance that needed to be struck between the two. Absolute freedom is is the right of the strongest to dominate, Camus wrote, while absolute justice is achieved by the suppression of all contradiction. Therefore, it destroys freedom. And I think it's that philosophical balance that explains the two acts of Bushwhacked. For lack of a better term, the Reavers are bad faith id monsters, devoid of guilt or compassion, not immoral, but utterly amoral, devoid of conscience. And without the ability to make choices that might be in opposition to their own desires, they may as well just be another meteor or an asteroid hurtling through the nothingness 
objects in space. Notice, too, that the Reavers aren't even in this episode. In that sense, they are nothing, and yet their influence is still powerful, the right hand of nothingness. And throughout, the crew regularly make verbal comparisons between the two. Reavers might take issue with that philosophy, if they had a philosophy. Reavers ain't men. They're just nothing. It's impressive what nothing can do to a man, like that fellow we bumped into. When the Reavers leave a man behind, that man becomes one of them. Being overcome by the nothing turns you into it. But some form of the term civilization also appears five times throughout this one. And the Reavers' philosophical counterpoint on the spectrum, going by Camus' statement, are the Alliance, stewards of a society they consider just but not free, as it isn't one that allows for contrarian voices. If Reavers indicate a nihilistic absence of philosophy, the Alliance then represent institutional thought. The juxtaposition of the Reavers to the Alliance begins immediately, starting with the game of hoop ball, where the members of the crew with closer ties to the Alliance watch from above. And then when the crew fears the Reavers have returned to their trap, and instead... Firefly class transport, you are ordered to release control of your helm. Prepare to dock and be boarded. In stark contrast to the reaver fight survival, the Alliance outfits are crisp, structured, and orderly. During the conversation in the mess, notice again the repetition of the word civilization. Reavers ain't men. Of course they are. Too long removed from civilization, perhaps. But men. And somewhere in the middle, passing back and forth between the two influences, is serenity. This is beautifully represented by the shot of the Tams clinging to her exterior. The way the shot is blocked, the Tams are physically hiding from the Alliance behind serenity. Being this close to the nothing of space and absolute freedom makes Simon uneasy. He is a creature of the Alliance who is in this situation because of his love for his sister, not out of any deep desire to be free of civilization. But that civilization has not been kind to River. She stares into the abyss with awe and looks as though she might just let go and kick away. There are parallels between River, tortured by the Alliance, the surviving colonist, tortured by the Reavers, and, since the crew members can all in some way be seen as an aspect of him, he looked right into the face of it, was made to stare. A darkness, the kind of darkness you can't even imagine. They made him watch, and he probably tried to turn away. They wouldn't let him. You call him a survivor, he's not. Mal. Alone, the surviving colonist became untethered. But Simon keeps River in the world, and Serenity and her crew do the same for Mal. This is the constant balance they are always fighting for. They rebel against the Reavers and total metaphorical freedom. Some guiding ethos and morality has purpose. How we treat our dead is part of what makes us different than those did the slaughtering. And they rebel against the absolute structure and abdication of freedom that the Alliance represent. Not the only oddity, this end of space, Commander. Rules can be a mite fuzzier. During his interrogation, Mal smiles and speaks what might be one of my favorite lines in the series, as well as one of its most important. Seems odd you name your ship after a battle you're on the wrong side of. May have been the losing side. Still not convinced it was the wrong one. The futility of an act doesn't dictate its value. Right and wrong aren't defined through power or freedom, and meaning ensues somewhere in between. That's Mal. Like Sisyphus heading down to get his rock again. In his conclusion to the myth of Sisyphus, Camus wrote, I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain. One always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes that all is well. This universe henceforth without a master seems to him neither sterile nor futile. Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain, in itself forms a world. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy.